Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to have you here this afternoon on this somewhat cloudy day here in Washington. I hope your weather is nice where you are. Had a good weekend, had a good day off on Monday. It's nice just to take a, a break. It was a pajama day for me. I don't think I ever got out of my pajamas that day. I like those days. Uh, just a day of rest. But again, it's wonderful to have you here. We're here to pray for the pandemic and for our own lives. Let's begin with prayer. Kind Father, I thank you for this day and I thank you for everyone gathered to watch and those who will yet be watching later on YouTube. I thank you for your presence with us, Lord. I thank you for righteousness, Lord. A righteousness not of our own making, but a righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith, on the basis of simply trusting you to do in us and for us what we can't do for ourselves. Thank you that righteousness is godly living, holy living, but it is also living in right relationship with you, Lord, so we don't have to walk in guilt or shame or sorrow or despair or resentment or bitterness or unforgiveness. We thank you that the righteousness you bring is pure, unadulterated, holy. That, we've been a, that we have been set aside for righteousness. And Father, I look at the world today and that word does not describe the world within which we live. The world in which we live is a world of unrighteousness, a world in which people have largely abandoned any relationship with you. A world in which we have all set ourselves up as our own gods, as a nation, we our nation's mantras just believe in yourself. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Forgive us as a nation. Forgive us as a world. And even making that request, I'm mindful that on the cross you already paid for the sins of the whole world. And yet, prior to coming to Christ, we do not stand unacquitted. Or we do not stand acquitted, Lord. And Father, I, I sense your love for this world, Lord. This world sitting on death row, already done the crimes, already sentenced, already found guilty. And you offer us in the world a full pardon but for entrusting our lives to you, but for believing in Jesus, being persuaded that you are the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, God in the flesh. You've made it simple, Lord, and I give you praise for that, that even small children can understand your gospel. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Thank you for the righteousness which comes from Jesus. That in the end, Jesus is our righteousness. And so, Father, I, I pray that you would turn the world's hearts towards home. You've placed eternity in all of our hearts, that longing for a home to which we've never been, and yet a home for which we have been made. A home abiding in your love. A home lived in your very presence. a home prepared for us by the wounded hands of Jesus.
And so, Father, my prayer today is do whatever it takes to draw this wicked world that you've already forgiven back to you, to a righteousness not of their own making, but a righteousness that comes through our simply trusting you, believing in you. My own desire is that this pandemic would end very quickly. For our sakes, for our church's sake, for all of our church's sake, for this nation's sake, for the world's sake. And so as Jesus prayed in the garden, we also pray, take this cup from us, Lord. And yet we also pray, not as we will, but your will be done. Thank you for doing your good work. Thank you for loving this old, tired world. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving a people sitting in great darkness, no longer even walking or standing but in despair, sitting in a great darkness of our own moral filth. Call people out, Lord. Call them by name. Let them hear your clarion voice. Come to me, all who are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for such an invitation. When we're worn out by our own sin, when we're worn out by our own effort and our own striving, when we are worn out by trying to keep the dictates of the religion of the day, you beckon us to come and take upon ourselves the yoke of your grace. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, Lord. Give us ears to hear your word today, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you for joining me today. My mom is sitting here and my wife Nancy's sitting here with me. It's always nice to have company, to have my family here with me. Today we're coming to Psalm 26. It's 12 verses and it's a psalm I read and I go, hmm. What do I do with this one? It's To me, it's a difficult psalm, and I prayed about it, and the direction the Lord took me in is a little different, but hear me out. And so let's read the psalm. Again, I'll be, Bill, I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible, Psalm 26, verses 1 through 12. At the very beginning of the psalm, it says, of David. It's a psalm of David. Vindicate me, O Lord. For I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and my heart. For your loving kindness is always before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. I did not sit with deceitful men, nor will I go with pretenders. I hate the assembly of evildoers. And I will not sit with, sit with the wicked. I shall wash my hands in innocence. And I will go about your altar, O Lord, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and declare all your wonders, O Lord. I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not take my soul away uh, along with sinners, nor my life with men of bloodshed, 
in whose hands is a wicked scheme, in whose right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on a level place. In the congregations, I shall bless the Lord. Does some of that language make you nervous? I can't say this. I, I, I can't. I read this psalm and I go, that's not me. Uh, I'm far from this psalm. Uh, I've not lived a life of integrity. Maybe more so late, <laughs> more lately because of the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. But in my earlier days, this was, this was not my life at all. So it makes me wonder, what do we do with this? So I want to look at the title again. It says, Of David. And there's some debate about this because it mentions the temple or, or the house, his house. And so people think that this is actually a psalm that was written near the end of the kingdom of Judah. It has language similar to Jeremiah and so on. But I looked back in the text, and I looked in the Masoretic text, which is the Hebrew text that we have, the reliable Hebrew text, that has been, um, it was actually copied for about from 700 to 1,000. That's when this text was used uh, prevalently or predominantly. This was AD, after Christ. And so that's where we get those little points on the, the Hebrew letters there. You see those, they're called vowel points, and it's, it gives us the understanding of how to translate it. And all it says is, of David, in the Hebrew. Or you can go back to the Greek Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, which was done, completed in 132 BC. And this is the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, translated into Greek, which Jesus and the disciples and Paul and James, they all quoted from the from the Greek Septuagint. That's the Bible they were using. They didn't really understand Old Testament Hebrew anymore. They spoke Aramaic, which is a variation on Hebrew, a later rendering of Hebrew, if you will. And so right within the text, it says, of David. That's part of verse 1 of David. Sometimes we don't put that with the verse. but uh, So I take that seriously. It, it, it's a psalm of David. And that changes how I translate or how I interpret the psalm. So let's keep going. This is a fascinating psalm because, again, it's a chiasmus, a structure that has, uh, it's an oral, part of oral culture where people spoke and didn't have writing. They would speak their way into a thought and then speak their way back out of the thought. And so Wikipedia defines it as a reversal of grammatical structures in successive phases or clauses, but no repetition repetition of words or sometimes very little repetition of words. And so the reversal of grammatical structures, you have these structures of A1, B1, and then you have C in the middle, and then we reverse that structure and go back out to B2 and A2. And always in a chiasmus, it's that center idea, that C, that's important. And we'll find within C, there's a further little chiasmus or more definition of that chiasmus. But I, I love the beauty of, of, of Hebrew poetry, how it how carefully it has been crafted, if you will. Beyond this, I have learned something about Hebrew poetry yesterday that I didn't know in re researching this psalm. And there are three kinds of lines used in Hebrew po poetry. There, there are colons, which is a single line of poetry, and the plural is kola. A bicolon, two lines of po poetry set in parallelism to each other, referred to as a sing single unit, and plural is bicola. So you have one line and then in response to that line, it's often in contrast or in agreement, however it's set, there's these two lines that are couplets. We would call them couplets. But this psalm is a series of couplets all the way down. And then there are psalms that have tricolons, three lines of poetry set in parallelism to each other, referred to as a single unit, called a tricola. Well, this psalm has bicola all the way through it, and I'll show you that. So in verses 1 through 3, it has three bicola. Verses 4 and 5 have two. Verses 6 through 8, again, have three bicola. And then verses 9 and 10 and 11 and 12 both have two bicola. So there's these couplets all the way through this. And why I bring that up is you'll see it. 
so clearly as we go through. And the meaning is, if you've done any research on grammar, I love grammar, there's this punctuation we use called a semicolon. And a semicolon always has two complete sentences on either side of that semicolon. And the idea is caught up in, in the, the fullness of the idea one is trying to get across, is caught up in, the, in these two sentences being put right next to each other. In the same way, these bicola or these, these um, bicolons, they're set so that the meaning is drawn out out of the whole couplet, not just one line. Well, let's get on. That's probably enough of Hebrew poetry for you. I love this stuff. I think it's the Holy Spirit has used the beauty of, of language to convey his truth. So let's uh, work through this psalm very quickly. Um, psalm 26, verses 1 through 3. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. So at this point in David's life, there's some kind of trouble in his life. He has enemies who are being deceitful, wicked men who are lying about him without cause. And so he's asking the Lord, he's asking the Lord to put him in to the courtroom of God and to try his case. Vindicate me, justify me, O Lord. For I have walked, and notice what he says, I have walked in my integrity. Can you say that? That you have locked, lived your life walking in your integrity. I don't know if I can, I, I know I can't say that. And I trust in the Lord without wavering. And the Lord there, of course, we see is Yahweh, the name Yahweh. And of course, as we've seen many times, Jesus came along and, and he says, I am the good shepherd before Abraham was, I am, re referencing this forever name of God, Yahweh. So Jesus is Yahweh in the mystery of the Trinity. I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Even in Abraham's life, it says in Romans that he never wavered in his faith. But when we've done a close Bible study on the story of Abraham, he and Sarah too waver at every point. Uh, they're always coming up with these contingency plans. He goes down to Egypt and tells the Pharaoh that Sarah, who's going to be the mother of this unborn child, this promised child, he, he tells them that, She's my sister, and so Pharaoh brings her into his household as a, as a wife and does it again with Abimelech. He suggests uh, Eleazar as an heir of the house. He, after God has told him it's going to be his descendant, then Sarah concocts the idea of, let's have you go into Hagar, and that will be descendant. Contingency plans, not trusting God. They wavered. Jacob wavered. Joseph wavered at times. Early, early in his life. Certainly the 12 brothers all wavered in their violence. And David is saying here, and I have trusted in Yahweh without wavering. I don't know if I've done that completely for a whole day. And then he continues and he says, says examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and my heart. And this is difficult. He's saying, look at my life and see where, if there's any fault in me. You be the judge. You examine my life. And of course, we know that God knows all things. He examines our thoughts. He knows our thoughts from afar. And then he finishes with, for your loving kindness is before my eyes. That loving kindness is that hesed, covenant, long-suffering love that God promises to be for us no matter what. So what David is saying is he's kept that has said love before his eyes, and I have walked in your truth. And I go, wow, David. I wonder if he was young when he wrote these words. And maybe up to this point, this could have been true of him. And then notice the, the counterpart in the chiasmus. We go down to the end, the last two verses. I know we have three verses and two verses, but you have that intervening, examine me, O Lord, and try me, test my mind and heart. There's no corresponding bicola for that. that there's no corresponding couplet for that uh, phrase. But notice in verse 26, 11, and 12, but as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Up above it says, vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. So you can see the parallel, parallelism there. 
My foot stands on a level place, and it, that would go with for your loving kindness is before my eyes. So God's very, very loving kindness, that Hesed love, is a le level place on which David stands. I like that. I can stand in God's long-suffering, Hesed, long or patient love with me. And then he says, I've walked in your truth. I shall bless the Lord. Those go in line together as well. So get this. He says, I have walked in my integrity. Therefore, I'm able to, to stand in a level place. And in the congregations, I shall bless the Lord. You could only stand in the congregations if you were living the right kind of life. This means the assembly that would be gathered for worship. Then we move on to the second. That was A1 and A2. Now we move on to B1 verses 4 and 5 and B2 verses 9 and 10. And these both have two bicola, so they match up two couplets, so they match up wonderfully. I do not sit with deceitful men, nor will I go with pretenders. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. And then in contrast with that, do not take my soul along with the sinners, nor my life with men of bloodshed in whose hand is a wicked scheme, and whose right hand is full of bribes. So David says, I've never sat with wicked people. I've never sat in their way. I've never sat down and befriended them. I've, I've kept my distance from these kinds of people in my life. I do not sit with deceitful men, nor will I go with pretenders. I have been a deceitful man. I have been a pretender. I have been an evildoer, and I have not only sat with the wicked, I've been the wicked with which people sat. Left up to me, God would have sent me to hell a long time ago. I've never been directly a man of bloodshed, but I got people started on drugs, and I may have very well cost them their lives. in whose hand is a wicked scheme. I've had wicked schemes in my life, and his right hand is full of bribes. I've never bribed somebody, so I got, I'm off one out of eight. Uh, one out of eight isn't bad. Something just popped up in my computer. Let me see if this is still working for you. Yeah, it is. Okay. And then we move on in, in the psalm. Where are we? Right here. And we, again, we come to this chiasmus, and now we get to this, that center. And there's three couplets, three bicola in this verses 6 through 8. And watch how wonderfully they match up. I shall wash my hands in innocent, innocence. It's hard to see them when it's just all together, so I've separated them out so you can actually see those couplets. I shall wash my hands in innocence, and I will go about your altar, O Lord. He's saying he's completely innocent. He has no blood on his hands no wickedness on his hands, no sin. And then coupled with that is, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. So only those people with innocent hands, washed hands, could live in the house of God and the place where your glory dwells. Here's where people think, well, this is a much later psalm because your house. But there was a tent in which David had placed the ark, and I assume they were still doing... Uh, sacrifices in that it wasn't tent, the tent of meeting from the wilderness wanderings because that would have been uh, many many years before this what two or three hundred years before this or two hundred years before this so that tent would have been worn out so they had a new tent which had the ark of the covenant which had an altar in front of it and to go into that altar to to approach that altar you had to first wash your hands in the there, uh, there is a, I think it was called the labor, a huge basin of water that was there. And they would wash their hands and then they could approach the altar. And so he says, I wash my hands in innocent, innocence. I'm not even having to wash my hands in that ritual cleansing of any sin in my life. And I love these words. I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. I love to be in the glory of God. To be sitting in that outpouring of his wonder and his compassion and his love and grace and being slow to anger and abounding in loving hesed love and truth. 
So we have those two in parallel, those two couplets in parallel. Now we get to the center one, and this again is a couplet, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and declare all your wonders, O Lord. So the very heart of this psalm is a voice of thanksgiving and David's desire to declare all of your wonders. I tell my story a lot. And when I tell, tell my story, I'm not telling one on myself. It's not on out of pride I tell my story. It's out of the wonder that God could take a man like me and save me, deliver me. I destroyed my voice. He gave me back words not to sing my own praises, but to declare the wonders of God in creation, in the beauty of a human face, but more in the righteousness which he brings to broken lives, in the healing he brings, in the restoration, in the reconciliation, in the redemption that he brings. That I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving for what God has done, for what he is doing now, and for what he is yet to do. And declare all your wonders, O Lord. So there you have the, that whole psalm with the chiasmus, looking at that chiasmus. But as I read these words again in the first two sections of the chiasmus, A and B, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I walked in, in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and my heart, for your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. And then its counterpart, but as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. That's a wonderful prayer. My foot stands on a level place. In the congregations, I shall bless the Lord. And I think about David's life, and I think, this has to be before some events in his life that he, that he wrote this psalm. Or again, I do not sit with deceitful men, nor will I go with pretenders. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. Do not take my soul away along with sinners, nor my life with men of bloodshed, in whose hand is a wicked scheme, and whose right hand is full of bribes. And I think about these words and the words in the last section of this chiasmus, this chiastic structure. And I think about David's story of Uriah and Bathsheba. And this whole psalm falls apart for David. Just as this whole psalm falls apart for me. And I suspect that this whole psalm falls apart for you too. Can you walk can you say, I walked in my integrity, that I have trusted in the Lord without wavering? So we're going to look at the story of Uriah and Bathsheba. It's a long story, so stick with me. It's a wonderful story. It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, through chapter 12, verse 14. And we could read all the way through chapter 16 or 17, 18, 19 to get the whole context, but I'm not going to take that much time but we will read this story second samuel chapter 11 verse 1 then it happened in the spring at the time when kings go out to battle that david sent joab and his servants with him in all israel notice what it says at the time when kings go out to battle that means king david and what does king david do he's going to take a holiday he's going to go on holiday and send his general joab and his servants with him and all Israel to go out to battle. That David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the sons of Am Amnon or Ammon, the Ammonites, right? Amnon, Ammon, and besieged Reba. But David stayed in, at Jerusalem. That was a dangerous thing for David to do. He should have been with his troops, but he chose to take a rest. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. It was on the most elevated part of the city. And walked around on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So first of all, you have 
he's a, what is it, a peeping Tom? Looking at this woman bathing on, on the roof of her house. And he noticed her incredible beauty. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So Uriah is not a Jewish person. He's not an Israelite. He's not a Hebrew person. He's a Hittite, a foreigner. But he's in the army fighting for David. So maybe Bathsheba was Jewish. We don't know. It never says uh, whether she was of the nation of Israel or whether she was a Hittite, but I assume she's an Israelite. And Uriah had married her. David sent the messengers and took her. When a king sent for a woman, she did not have the wherewithal in that society to say no to a king. King had absolute say over your life, over your death. So she's not a willing uh, agent in this. She's not a willing participant in this. In a sense, she is a, well, she is a victim of David's abuse of his power. David, mess David sent messengers and took her. And when she came to him, he lay with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanliness, we won't go into that, but that's all in the law, she returned to her house. <coughs> the woman conceived, oops. And she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. Now David has a dilemma. He's done this horrendous thing. He's committed adultery. He's lusted. He's a peeping Tom. He's into voyeurism. Then David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. So David has now hatched a contingency plan, a plan of how to get out of this. So David sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked concerning the welfare of Joab and the people in the state of the war. So he's giving Uriah a pretext for why he's called him because Uriah is probably wondering, why did David call me out of the battle? I'm not the general, I'm just one of the soldiers. So he gives him pretext about inquiring about the battle. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And so he's asking Uriah to go down to his house, enjoy some time with his wife, so that when the pregnancy is revealed and she starts getting large with child, Uriah would think that it was because he had slept with his wife that night he was home from the battle. And Ur Uriah went out of the king's house and a present from the king was sent out after him. So the, it, it, it's a bribe, right? It's, it's, uh, he's manipulating this man completely. But look at this man, Uriah, a Hittite. He has more integrity than David, far more integrity than David. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants uh, of his lord and did not go down to his house. So he slept with the servants of David's house outside at the door of the king's house. Now, when they told David, saying Uriah did not go down to his house, David's now in a quandary because Bathsheba is still pregnant with his child. Uriah hasn't gone into her, so now there's this chance of him his getting caught with his pants down, pun intended. Sorry about that. David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I, go th shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? What did David do? He stayed home from the battle. He stayed in his palace, in his wonderful house, and he lied with another man's, he uh, had sexual relations with another man's wife. By your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. That's an interesting. By your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, stay here also, and tomorrow I will let you go. Stay one more day. David's still going to get him to go in and sleep with his wife. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem the next, the, that day and the next. Now David called him, and he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. So if the king keeps pushing liquor on you, you can't refuse him. You just keep downing those, whatever the beverage was. 
and he made him drunk, and in the evening he went out to lie on his bed with his Lord's servants, but he did not go down to his house. So even when Uriah is drunk, he doesn't lose his integrity. Alcohol is something that shuts off our brain, shuts off our integrity, but for Uriah, he had enough honor and loyalty to David and loyalty, loyalty to the troops and to Joab that he slept with the servants again. But he did not go down to his house. Now in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. David's two attempts to resolve his problem, his conundrum, his sin, fail. Now look, look at what David does. He had written in the letter saying, Place Uriah in, fr in the front line of the fiercest battle and withdraw from him, so that he may be struck down and die. I wonder what Joab is thinking. Joab is maybe thinking, well, this is a Hittite. Maybe he wants to get rid of him. Well, this is racism involved here then, horrible racism. So it was as Joab kept watch, so it was as Joab kept watch on the city that he put Uriah at the place where he knew that there were valiant men. The men of the city went out and fought against Joab and some of the people among David's servants fell and Uriah the Hittite also died. David's now murdered this man intentionally taken his life because of his own sin. Then Joab sent and reported to David all the events of the war. He charged the messenger, saying, When you have finished telling all the events of the war to the king, and it happens that the king's wrath rises, and he says to you, Why did you go so near to the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? That's not what actually happened. What happened was the men from the city came out and fought. Who struck down Abimelech, the son of Jerubbesheth? Did not a woman throw an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died at Thebes? Why did you go so near the wall? Then you shall say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So it's a way of disguising what they have done. Deceit. a pretender wearing a mask. So the messenger departed and came and reported to David all that jo Joab sent to tell him. The messenger said to David, the men prevailed against us and came out against in the field, but we pressed them as far as the entrance of the gate. Moreover, the archers shot at your servants from the wall. So some of the king's servants are dead and your servant Uriah the Hittite is also dead. Whew. Now David can rest easy. Yeah, right. He can rest easy because now everyone will still think that Uriah had somehow slept with his wife and got her pregnant. Then David said to the messengers, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Make your battle against the city stronger and overthrow it, and so encourage him. Now, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. It would have been a season of mourning, a period of mourning. When the time of the mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife. By outward appearances, David is doing this noble thing of taking this poor widow whose husband was killed in the war and taking her into his own house to be his wife, to give her a life, to give her a future. Then she bore him a son. But the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. <laughs> no kidding! Think of that psalm. Everything we've seen in this psalm so far. Uh, we're not quite done with this story yet because it continues in chapter 12, verses 1 and following. Then the Lord said to Nathan, sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, Nathan's a prophet. There were two men in one city, and the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he, brought and which he bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and his children. It would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his boos bosom, and was like a daughter to him. Now a tra traveler came to the rich man, 
and he was unwilling to take from him take from his own flock or from his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him rather he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him dastardly that this man would take this poor man's ewe and not take from his the wealth of his own flock then David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He just pronounced the death sentence on himself. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold. How can he make restitution for Uriah? He's killed him. Because he did this thing and had no compassion. There was no compassion in the heart of David in what he did. Nathan then said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, It is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who de delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives in your care, and I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. Notice the Lord calls him, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. It doesn't call her Bathsheba at this point. Reminding that David had done this dastardly thing of this horrible, wicked thing of killing this man's wife to cover up his own sin. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. I'm ex going to expose your shame, David, from a member of your own household. If you read on from here, oh, there's a little bit more left. Then David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. I've sinned against Yahweh. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die even though David had pronounced the death sentence against himself, the Lord is showing compassion on David, a compassion that David could not show on his own soldier. However, because by this deed you have, been, you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, they're going to ridicule my name because of what you did. You not only soiled your witness, David, you soiled my witness. The child also that is born to you shall surely die. So not Bathsheba not only has the horror of losing her husband, the horror of essentially being raped by David and then being impregnated by him, but then to lose the child as well. If you continue reading after chapter 12 into 13, 14, 15, you get the story of Abimelech. And, the, and in chapter 13 of 2 Samuel, you get the story of the rape of Tamar, one of David's daughters, uh, sister, full sister to, Ab, to Absalom. And one of the brothers, uh, Amnon, rapes Tamar. It's, it's uh, half-brother to, Tam, to Tamar. And when David finds out about it, he doesn't do anything about it. And as king, he had the moral responsibility to bring justice to his son Amnon by putting him to death. Well, he didn't do it, so then Abimelech bides his times and finally murders Amnon and then has to flee from David because David is so, I mean, Absalom, not Abimelech, Absalom um, bides his time and finally kills Amnon and then has to flee from David's presence because David is ticked at Absalom for killing Amnon. And so again, we have David's wickedness even getting worse. This is all be resulting in the curse that came upon him from Yahweh because of his sin with Bathsheba. And that prophecy that 
one from your own household will lie with your wives. We get to 2 Samuel chapter 16, verses 20 to 22. Uh, Absalom has won the hearts of the people of Israel over to himself. He's now come to Jerusalem. David has had to flee with his families uh, over the Mount of Olives, down towards Jericho. And there, there was this advisor named Athophel, or ha Ahithophel. Then Absalom said to ah ah Ahithophel, Give your advice. What shall we do? Ahithophel said to Absalom, Go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house. Then all Israel will hear that you have made yourself odious to your father. The hands of all who are with you will also be strengthened. What a horrible thing to tell uh, Absalom to do. To go into David's wives, his concubines. They were considered kind of a lower status wife. So they pinched a tet for Absalom on the roof, and Absalom went into his fa father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. That's exactly what God said would happen, what Yahweh would say, said would happen. Now we get back to the psalm, those the parallel passages in, in the chiastic structure of Psalm 26. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I told you this was a psalm of David, showed you it in both the Hebrew text and the Greek text. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. And I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and my heart. For your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. David showed no compassion to Uriah. To Uriah nor to Bathsheba. He's not walked in truth. He's walked in deceit. He's not walked in his integrity. He's not trusted in God. He's trusted in his own manipulations. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Ha! Redeem me and be gracious to me. Well, that prayer I can, I can get a hold of. My foot stands on a level place. David's foot did not stand on a level place. He was up on the roof. In the congregations, I will bless the Lord. By the standards of the, of the moral law of the Ten Commandments and of the law of Moses, David had some, committed so much sin, he should have been killed for this. He has no right now to stand in the presence of God. And then the second the B and the B, B2, B1 and B2 in, in this chiastic structure of Psalm 26. I do not sit with deceitful men. He is the deceitful man. Nor will I go with pretenders. He pretends to be this great friend of Uriah who wines and dines him and calls him from the battle, befriends him, when really he's just manipulating the man because of having committed adultery with this man's wife. I hate the assembly of evildoers. David is the assembly of evildoers in this case. And I will not, not sit with the wicked. This sounds more like a psalm that Uriah could have, could have sung or Uriah could have penned. Do not take my soul away along with the sinners. And here David is the very one whose soul should be taken away because of his own sin. Nor my life with men of bloodshed. And David's hands are dripping with blood, the blood of Uriah, in whose hands is a wicked scheme. Let's see, he had the scheme of bringing Uriah out of battle. He had the scheme of, of getting him drunk so he would sleep with his wife. Then he had the scheme of having him killed in battle and making it look like Uriah was valiant and fighting all out there by himself against the onslaught of the Ammonites, and whose right hand is full of bribes. Wasn't he bribing Uriah by the offer of wine? Wasn't he bribing Uriah by bringing him home? At least he was manipulating him. I don't know, David. I don't know, Grant. I've done dastardly things in my life. I can't pray Psalm 26. It's not my words. It's not my language. And I suspect it's not words that you could pray either.
it's funny when we get to the New Testament, this passage is so beautifully or horribly depicted in Jesus' own words in the Sermon on the Mount. We begin with verse 17 of Matthew 5. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until it all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Throughout my life, I've been beat up by this passage, saying, see, you got to keep the laws. It's an eternal thing. These commandments will never pass away. Then look, then look at where Jesus goes with this. Notice that he says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, the scribes were the experts, the teachers of the law. They were the seminary professors of their day who knew the law inside and out. They knew all the arguments, all the different understandings, all the different in interpretations. And then there, the, there were the Pharisees. They were the practical men. They were the men who tried to live out every jot and tittle of the law. So much so they even would wear a phylactery on their forehead. It was a little leather box that, command, that contained the Shema, Hear, O Israel, that the Lord is one. And they were formidable men in their effort to keep the law. They surrounded the law with all their fence laws, these little rules to make sure they, they wouldn't break the law, any part of the law. They were especially uh, keen on the Sabbath, keeping that holy. They had all kinds of laws to keep the Sabbath holy. If, if a person in that day wanted to see a righteous person, they would point to a Pharisee. Who's your best example of a, of a righteous person in your day? And they would have pointed exactly to a Pharisee. Pharisees, by the time they were sixth, would have memorized the first five books of the law, or the, the books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That was your average Pharisee kid had memorized that whole thing. We don't understand oral cultures how much um, effort they put into memorization. And by the time they had reached adulthood and well into their years, they would have memorized the entire Hebrew scriptures. These were extremely dedicated, sincere, zealous men. And yet Jesus describes them later in Matthew as men full of dead men's bones, men similar to David, men similar to you and I, whether we're men or women. Well, I'm not similar in the sense of my righteousness have never even come close to this. So Jesus says, for I say to you in that, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of, of heaven. David's righteousness did not surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees. He then continues and he says, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. What did David do? He committed murder. And because of that, the penalty for committing murder was an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. It was death. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. How many times have you been angry with a brother? I was angry at a brother last week, and I had to quickly repent of that. We've forgiven each other. I love him more than he can ever know. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Oopsie. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing. My dad grew up calling me a good for nothing. You, you good for nothing, lazy, worthless son. He told me that repeatedly through the days of my junior high and high school. I love my dad. I've forgiven him. But this says that he is guilty, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into fiery hell. You fool is the same thing as calling somebody a jerk. How many times driving have I said, you jerk? Or vice versa, when I was in my aggressive days of my driving, people would say, you jerk, to me in return. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and there, 
and there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. And then it continues, make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way so that your opponent, opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you will be thrown into prison. David should have been brought before the court, only he was the court. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you've paid up the last cent. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And we could read this. You've heard that it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say that every woman who looks after a, a man with lust in her heart has already committed adultery with him in her heart. It applies to both men and women, certainly. Think about David. His sin began on the rooftop. When he looked down, he saw Bathsheba bathing naked and saw her beauty. And that's, what, that's where the sin was hatched. Before he ever did the act, it was hatched in his mind and in his heart, his desires. This text has always bothered me too, because, man, I can't keep the law. My, my righteousness will never surpass that of the Pharisees and scribes. It says, no jot or tittle shall pass away from the law until all is fulfilled. And we know that all things aren't fulfilled in the law yet. There are still prophecies to come. But get this, Romans says we are no longer under law, but under grace. Galatians says that, do not submit yourselves again to a yoke of slavery. For freedom, Christ has set us free. So what's going on here? The law is still in place. It is given for lawbreakers, it says in 1 Timothy. It still has its per per prophetic role. But Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Now let me show you a, a, this most amazing verse. In John chapter 19, verse 30, Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. He cried out, we know from other, he shouted out, It is finished! And he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. That word, it is, it is finished, is a remarkable word. Let me show you. We're not supposed to do this, but I, I don't know how else to do this, but to show you what the original word means in, in the language of the day, Greek. And so here is Bauer, Arndt, Gingrich, and Danker, that wonderful Greek dictionary. It is the gold standard of dictionaries. So the actual form of the word, the word is teleo. And what Jesus cries out is tetelestai, tetelestai. And we know that He's not speaking Aramaic here because early on he speaks Aramaic, uh, Lama Lama Sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Here he's speaking Greek. And ironically, what he, what he shouts out from the cross is the Roman battle cry when, a, when the general would be up on the hill and he would see that the battle is won. There were still little skirmishes to be, to be had and to win, but overall the tide of the battle had so gone for the Romans that the, the battle, the general would cry out, Tetelestai! And all the soldiers down fighting the battle would know that the battle was won, and that would only increase their strength to fight the battle all the harder. No wonder why the Roman centurion, surely this is the Son of God. And so this word, it is finished, is one verb here. It's a verb. It has three meanings. And usually this is a fallacy when we do this. You can't take all three meanings and apply it to the word. But in, in this context, Jesus is doing a wonderful play on words here. And it's, it's the richness of what this word means and how, it's, how every meaning fits the case. It is finished. To complete an activity or process, bring to an end, finish, finish complete. So to finish an activity. And for Jesus, it would be to have finished that, his life perfectly lived, to have finished his work here on earth. But it was also that same definition that, that was given to Tetelestai, that Roman battle cry, the battle is won, it's finished, it's, it's over, it's complete. Do you realize what that's saying for you? 
there's no more battle to be fought on your on your your part jesus has fought our battles yeah we have the skirmishes with the enemy i have skirmishes every almost every day with him he comes and plagues me in one form or another and i have to resist them and submit to god and then he flees you get what he's saying it is finished the battle's won we're victorious even in the state I am in today, I am victorious. The second def definition is to carry out an obligation or demand, and it was specifically carry out, carry out, accomplish, perform, fulfill. There's that word to fulfill, to keep something. And what it was, it was a legal technical term, to keep the tonaman, which is the law. Carry out the demands or keep the law. And so the second meaning of this word is when Jesus shouts out, it is finished, it meant that he had kept the law fully. He had lived it out perfectly. Those two essential boiled down commands, if you boil the commands, if you uh, distill them down to their essential commands, you get love the Lord your God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus had finished that perfectly. It is finished. He had completely met the obligation of the law, not only for himself, but for you and I. The totality of the demands of the law, Jesus lived, and because he is a creator, and we were all in him on the cross, he finished those demands for us as well. And then thirdly, to pay what is due. Well, the, the law had demands of penalty for breaking it. And for every sin in our life, we've incurred a death sentence That that, because the penalty of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. I have a stack of death penalties stacked from here, I don't know, maybe to the moon? And when Jesus cried out, it is finished, he's saying, the debt is paid. My blood has been shed. It's paid the debt in full. It is finished. No more debt. No more sin debt. No more iniquity debt. No more transgression debt. We are forgiven. We are wholly pardoned. And it never gives us license to sin. It gives us the strong desire to pull in, to lean in heavily into this one who would so love us, who would so give up his life, do you hear this? Jesus said, until the law is fulfilled, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. And he cried out, it is finished. And by, by that, he had completed his work, lived the perfect life. He had met the, all of the just demands of the law on our behalf. And he had paid the debt that we owe. There are still parts of the law to be lived out. It's not taken out of the way, except for it's, we don't live under the law. We, we live under the spirit. The giver of the law, the author of the law, has come to live within. So now let me conclude with these verses from Philippians. This is the answer to, to David's dilemma. He was given life when he should have had death. We have been given life when we should have had death. I should have died by the time I was 26. Undoubtedly, I, I assumed. I'm so grateful for the 36, going on 37 years of life you have given me that God has given me since those days of my head injury and my wild living. From Philippians 3, 1 through 6. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Here's a man who could pray Psalm 26 with integrity. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it's a safeguard for you. And I've read these to you before, and it's a safeguard to you for you to hear them once again. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. In other words, beware of the Judaizers, like on Sundays, the super apostles who were trying to bring some element of the law back into the practice of the Christian life. And for them, it was the Ten Commandments. For we are the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. When you live under law, it's an external rule, and you have to keep it by the strength of your flesh. And what he's getting at is we are of the true circumcision, 
the circumcision of Christ, the circumcision which Jesus performed on the cross that separated us from our sin. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God, who live in the Spirit of God, and glory in Christ Jesus, not ourselves. There's no glory in this life. Just in Jesus. Just in what he's done in my life and what he's done in your life. And put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh because I was a really good boy, is what it's getting at. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. And then he lists his pedigree, his heritage, his standing, his righteousness. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel. So he was, he was under the covenant, the Mosaic covenant because of his circumcision. He was of the chosen people, the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, the most favored tribe because he was the youngest son, the favored son of, of, of Jacob. A Hebrew of Hebrews. If you want to see a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit, it would be Paul along with, uh, I think it was uh, Philip. A Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee, he was one of those formidable Pharisees. If your righteousness does not surpass that of the scribes or the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And here you have one of these Pharisees who was one of the most formidable Pharisees. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, if you will. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, trying to stamp out this cultic uh, offshoot of Judaism. As to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. I could never say that, and I trust, I know, I know, that none of you could say that. And look where he goes from here. But whatever things were gained to me, all these merits, all these statuses, all these achievements that are chalked up to my name, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. He has cast aside his standing as an, as an Hebrew of Hebrews, as an Israelite, as one circumcised under the law, as a Pharisee, as a zealot who is persecuting Christians, and the blamelessness which he had under the law. I have suffered the loss of all these things, and count them but rubbish, and the word is dung. It's a very crude term. It's worse than the word crap. We won't go there. For some reason, we don't. King James gets it right. It says dung, dung here, excrement. I count them, but all crap, so that I may gain Christ. All of my goodness, all of your goodness, all of your merits, everything you thought that were, that that you did in your life, that was man, that was, that was admirable. Whew, people are going to really notice me. I mean, found in Him. And count them but rubbish, that, so that I may gain Christ. You don't bring anything to Christ when you come to Christ. You don't bring your integrity. You don't bring your unwavering faith. You don't bring your righteousness. You don't bring your pedigree, your standing, your birthright. You bring nothing but empty hands full of your sin. Not ha and it may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. Do you hear that? Not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. David says, I walk in my integrity. I don't walk in my integrity. I don't walk in my righteousness. But that which is faith through faith in Christ. And literally it, it, it says here, but that which is through the faith of Christ. That's a whole nother sermon. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So if you see this, righteousness to us is a gift. Righteousness to David was a gift, wasn't it? He deserved death and he was given back life. He lost his son. He had this horrible encounter with Absalom later in his life. But God never gave up on his loving kindness. That long-suffering promise to be for us, even when we are against ourselves. But that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which 
comes from God on the basis of faith, that I might know him, know Jesus, and the power of his resurrection, that power that raised Jesus from the, from the dead, and the fellowship of his sufferings, right, getting into uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 now, we have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that this transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. The fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in my... I carry the death of Jesus in my body so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal bodies. Being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. What he's getting at is he wants to see the resurrection power in his life so strongly that he can see that resurrection power raising his life from the dead before from the from death before he's even dead. I've seen that resurrection power in my life, and I know I've seen that resurrection power in your life. Taking you for, from a past of self righteousness or self aggrandizement or pride or the sins of the flesh like me. Get this, having a righteousness, a righteousness of my own derived from the non law, not having that, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness, the righteousness, which comes from God on the basis of trusting him. Righteousness is a gift, folks. It was a gift to David. And now here's where we come to the center of that prayer again. I shall wash my hands in innocence, and I will go about your altar, O Lord. I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. In the Gospel of John, the place where God's glory dwells is the cross. And the only one in history who can wash their hands in this innocence and go to this altar of the cross and offer up his life is Jesus himself. He loves the habitation of the house because it's his house and the place where your glory dwells that I may proclaim with thanksgiving and declare all your wonders O Yahweh and here in the mystery of the Trinity this is a psalm of Christ this is not a psalm of David this is a psalm of Jesus he only fits the bill of the psalm we all fall short there was no one righteous not even one There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. We all have turned away. Together we have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one, except for Jesus Christ. So reread this psalm now, this afternoon or this evening, when you get a little bit of time. Think about the story of Bathsheba and Uriah. Think about Matthew 5 and Philippians chapter 3. And how the dilemma of Matthew 5 is resolved with Philippians chapter 3. We don't have a righteousness of our own making. I'm righteous because of the shed blood of Jesus. You are righteous because of the shed blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for what he's done. I've been a wretch of a man. He is transforming our lives from one degree of glory to another into the very image of Christ. And this comes from the Spirit, who is the Lord. Amen? We can take this center and we can say, I proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your ongoing transforming work. And I will declare your wonders. His salvation of me. His rescuing me from a desperate life. And now I get to declare his wonders everywhere he goes. And he even gives me words. He gives me boldness. He gives me his spirit. Because it's only by his spirit we can do anything. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him applies to women as well. He it is that bears much fruit. She it is that bears much fruit. For apart from you, or apart from me, apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. Nothing. 
There you have Psalm 10, through the eyes of this wicked heart, who's been redeemed, who's been given the gift of righteousness, a heart set free, a heart destined. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this gift of righteousness. Thank you for what you've done for us on the cross. Thank you that you are really the one who says Psalm 26. It's the voice of Jesus. He is the only one who has ever lived with that kind of integrity. Thank you for his most incredible sacrifice for us. The giving of his blood. The giving up his spirit. Shouting out, it is finished. The battle is won. My work is completed. The just demands of the law are met in my body and in my life. And Jesus has paid the debt in full. It is finished. Thank you, Lord, that we rest in you. Thank you, Lord, that we rest in your completed work. Thank you, Lord, for your righteousness. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your righteousness. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, thank you for joining me today. I'll be back tomorrow with Psalm 27, a wonderful psalm. And uh, never know where we're going to go with it until I get to researching it. Just very thankful you, you joined us today. Hope to see you back again tomorrow at 12 noon for Psalm 27. Here's our benediction from Jude 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.